Fresh water, salt water, brackish water, cold water, tropical, predator, fowler, SPS, mixed reef, nano. There's more, I just can't remember them all. This week, we're gonna talk all about aquariums. Hey everybody, Matthew here from My First Fish Tank working with Marine Depot. Welcome to week two of the beginner how-to guide to saltwater aquariums and reef tanks. If you miss week one, beginner questions, the link will be either up here or in the description below. Don't forget that our blogger, Max, has been busy writing the blog portion of this video series. So go to myfirstfishtank.com forward slash start dash here, start here to check all those out. And while you're there, why not consider signing up for the My First Fish Tank newsletter? You can find links to all the products we're talking about today at Marine Depot in the description below. And without further ado, let's get started with an existential question. What is an aquarium? The word aquarium can be broken down into its two Latin roots, aqua and arium. Aqua, of course, meaning water, and arium meaning a place for or pertaining to. So literally, aquarium means a place for water. The first primary definition of aquarium is just a building that contains aquariums. Think your large public aquariums like the Vancouver Aquarium, the Seattle Aquarium, Monterey Bay Aquarium, and Aquarium of the Pacific. But in the hobby, when we're talking about aquariums, we're talking about the second definition, which is a transparent tank of water. Just so you don't get confused, in the saltwater hobby, we use a few terms interchangeably. Aquarium, fish tank, and tank. If you ever hear me in one of these videos saying, my tank, my aquarium, or my fish tank, I'm just talking about saltwater aquariums. You can pretty much break down all types of aquariums into three categories. Freshwater, brackish water, and saltwater. Freshwater systems are exactly that. They contain water from lakes or from rivers and different kinds of livestock and plants that are native to freshwater environments. They can be cold water or they can be tropical and it just depends on what part of the world that livestock is from. The second type of tank is a brackish water tank and that is in between a freshwater and a saltwater. In nature, you can find brackish water where streams and rivers meet the sea and the fresh water and the salt water mix is together. It's a really unique environment and a harsh environment where the plants and the animals have to be able to survive varying degrees of salinity and salinity that can change really quickly with the tides. The perfect plant example of brackish water is the mangrove. Mangroves grow in both fresh water and salt water and you pretty much exclusively find mangroves in brackish water environments. And the third overarching type of aquariums and the type that matters obviously to us are saltwater aquariums. Saltwater aquariums have a salinity that matches that of the ocean. They can either be cold water aquariums or warm water tropical aquariums, although the vast majority of aquariums in this hobby are tropical aquariums. Typically these aquariums are made of glass or acrylic and standard home aquariums are usually made anywhere from five gallons all the way up to 250 gallons. But of course you can find some outliers outside of those ranges. For the most part, saltwater aquariums are pretty much the same. They use the same equipment and we'll go into all of the equipment in a later video. Yes, there are specialized types of saltwater aquariums that require specialized equipment, but typically in the saltwater hobby, we define our types of aquariums by what we put inside, not by the equipment. But that being said, each different type of saltwater aquarium will have its own unique specifications and we're gonna touch on those today, but not go into a lot of detail. All right, so let's just jump right in. 10 different types of saltwater aquariums. The hope is that it will wet your palate and get you pointed in the direction of the type of tank that you wanna build. Tank type number one, a cold water marine tank. Cold water marine tanks typically have a water temperature around 55 degrees, although that can vary. Think of the west coast of the United States, especially the Oregon and Washington coast, or think of the coast around the United Kingdom. Those are cold water environments, and typically what you'll find in a cold water tank are things that live in those environments. If you've ever been to the Oregon or Washington coast and gone through the really cool tide pools at low tide, you'll have a really good idea of what you could keep in a cold water system. Cold water systems are really challenging for a couple reasons. Number one, you have to keep the water really cold. 55 degrees means you need a really strong chiller that's gonna take a lot of energy to keep that tank cold. The second thing is go to Google and type in cold water marine fish store or something similar. They just 
don't exist. So unless you live near a cold water coastline, you may be out of luck. Cold water systems do have a few specialized pieces of equipment like the chiller, but they also usually have acrylic and thick acrylic tanks. Because in a cold water system, if you had a thin glass, First of all, the glass doesn't really offer any insulation and the glass would likely sweat, leaving moisture all over the floor. So typically a cold water marine tank isn't a beginner option, but if it's something you're really interested and you live near a cold water marine environment, then go for it. Do your research because these are beautiful tanks and not a lot of people in this hobby do cold water marine tanks. Aquarium type number two, a fish only tank. These are typically the tanks you find at nail salons, libraries, or doctor's offices, and they're usually decorated with fake plants and fake corals. These tanks are larger, 120 gallons to 240 gallons, because the cool livestock you wanna put in there typically need more space to swim around. Fish only systems are really attractive to beginners because you don't have to complicate things with corals or anemones or other inverts. And they're also oftentimes really attractive to professionals in this hobby because there are a lot of species of fish out there that will eat your corals. So why would you put corals in a tank with fish that are just gonna eat them? But just because you're thinking of building a fish only tank doesn't mean that you can just go out and buy whatever fish you want and put them in there. Some fish aren't good community fish. Some fish you can put a school in and other fish have to be solitary amongst their species. So you still need to do a lot of research to find the right balance of fish to go in a fish only tank. Aquarium type number three is what we call in the hobby a fowler system. Fish only with live rock. It's basically almost exactly the same as a fish only system, except that you're adding in what we call live rock. Live rock is typically one of two things. It's either dead coral skeletons that are pulled from the ocean, or it's some sort of human made porous rock. Either of them work really well in a tank, and the primary function of live rock is to act as a house for beneficial bacteria to help in the nitrogen cycle, which basically breaks down ammonia and turns it into nitrogen gas. Don't worry about all that biology. We will discuss that at much more depth in a later video. Live rock is not only a great thing for beneficial bacteria, but it also provides a home for various cleanup crew members, which will help keep your tank clean. And on top of that, when you aquascape live rock in cool shapes, you can provide a lot of overhangs and caves and places for fish to go and hide and feel safe which often makes them healthier and happier. Aquarium type number four are softy slash LPS tanks. A softy slash LPS tank, large polyp stony tank, is a tank that on top of fish puts primarily soft corals and large polyp stony corals. A soft coral is a coral that doesn't secrete a hard calcium carbonate skeleton, where a large polyp stony coral is a coral with soft, fleshy, large polyps that secretes a hard calcium carbonate skeleton. Soft corals typically are less expensive and grow really quickly, and large polyp stony corals are often more expensive and grow much, much more slowly. So why would a beginner want to build a softy slash LPS tank, which by the way, is my favorite style of tank, and that's what this one is right here? Well, there's a few reasons for that. One, soft corals and LPS corals are often easier for beginners to keep. They're more forgiving and have less demanding life requirements. Not only that, but especially soft corals, they grow really, really quickly and are oftentimes a lot less costly. So if you were to have some sort of mistake and it was to die, you wouldn't be out quite as much money. But the reason I think a lot of people like to build softy and LPS dominant tanks and the reason I like to build them is because the soft bodies and the long flowing polyps, when you put a wave maker in there, move around in an almost mesmerizing way and create this tidal wave-like action, which is just stunning. Aquarium type number five is an SPS tank. SPS are small polyp stony corals as opposed to large polyp stony corals. Some hobbyists go crazy for SPS and some SPS corals are really, really expensive. While I personally like the flow of LPS corals, I get the obsession with SPS corals because SPS corals can come in some mind blowing color patterns and in some really unique shapes that LPS corals just don't offer. But SPS tanks are really not recommended 
for beginners. Yes, there are some SPS corals out there that are really beginner friendly, but most of them have some pretty stringent requirements. They need really high lighting, really good water movement, and you have to keep your water parameters super stable. All of these things can be difficult for beginners who are gonna make mistakes. I'm not saying a beginner can't do an SPS tank, but they definitely are more challenging and will require you to do a lot more research and you're gonna have a lot more trial and error during the process. Basically, I would say that most SPS corals aren't resilient enough to survive the inevitable beginner mistakes. Tank type number six is a mixed reef tank. What do you get when you combine soft corals, LPS corals, SPS corals, maybe some anemones even? You get a mixed reef tank. All a mixed reef tank is, is a tank that mixes different types of corals. This is probably one of the most popular styles of tank out there because it allows you to put in all sorts of different kinds of livestock. Not that a mixed reef tank is any more difficult than an SPS tank or an LPS softy tank, but there are some special considerations before building one. First, you need to consider lighting. We'll go into par levels and spectrum in a later video, but basically you need to know that SPS corals require really, really high levels of light, where softies and LPS do well with low levels of light. So you need to have a really good understanding of where the light hits in your tank, what the different par levels are, so that you know where to place corals depending on their light needs. Another thing to consider is the water movement. SPS corals need oftentimes direct current, like a lot of movement in your tank, where if you were to put that same amount of water movement onto a large polyp stony or a soft coral, it may be too much and it may end up shriveling up and dying. So having an understanding of flow in your tank is really important so that you know where to put the appropriate coral. And the last thing to consider is that some corals, especially large polyp stony corals, are highly aggressive and territorial and have what are called sweeper tentacles. Most LPS corals seem peaceful enough during the day, but if you put them too close to other corals, you may come back in the morning and see a nearby coral with burn marks around it and maybe even receding in its skeleton. That's a surefire sign that the sweeper tentacles stung the surrounding corals. So in a mixed reef system, you also have to be considerate of where you place your corals so that there's enough space and territory for them to grow. Tank type number seven is a seahorse tank. I've never built a seahorse tank, but that's changing in 2021. Right here, I will build a seahorse tank and I'm super excited about it. Seahorses aren't necessarily more difficult, but their tanks have specific requirements. First of all, a seahorse tank typically needs to be a little bit larger, like 50 or 60 gallons at a minimum. And a lot of species of seahorses like cooler water. So if you live in the desert like I do, you're probably gonna need a chiller to keep that tank temperature down, especially in the summer. Seahorses like clean tanks and really, really low flow environments. Not only that, but they need plants or fake decorations to wrap their tails around. You can't really put certain species of corals or certain kinds of fake plants in a seahorse aquarium because one, the corals can sting the seahorse and two, certain plants can actually cut the seahorses. So you have to plan your livestock really intentionally in a seahorse tank. Seahorses can be really finicky eaters and they can be really prone to disease. So it's not an ideal beginner tank, but if you have your heart set on it, do your research and you can find success with the seahorse tank. Tank type number eight is a macro algae tank. When we're talking about macro algaes, we're talking about seaweeds. By the way, I'm gonna use a few pictures here from an Instagram account known as Tiger Boy. Taiga Boy has some of the most stunning macroalgae tanks I've ever seen. He may have the most beautiful macroalgae tanks I've ever seen. So Taiga Boy, thank you for letting me use these pictures. I'll put a link to his Instagram below. Check these tanks out, they're amazing. Macroalgae tanks are actually really good beginner tanks for a lot of reasons. First of all, macroalgae is extremely inexpensive to buy. It comes in a wide range of colors, and honestly, they just don't need much light, so they can be really easy to care for. That's not to say that you can just plop in a whole bunch of macroalgae and have success. There are different types of macroalgae, some of which are really easy and really hardy, and some of which are more finicky and difficult to keep. 
The really cool thing that I'm planning on doing is a macro algae tank is a perfect tank for seahorses. Not only are macro algae tanks low flow and really clean environments, but the macro algae itself offers great places for seahorses to attach onto. Another cool thing about macro algae tanks, where you could spend hundreds if not thousands of dollars stocking your tank with coral that takes years and years to grow, you could stock a large tank with beautiful macro algae for $100 and it will grow so fast that you will constantly have to trim it and give it to your new hobbyist friends. Tank number nine is a predator tank. These are tanks that contain fish that like to eat other fish. Think lionfish, eels, sharks, frogfish. Really cool livestock, but if you were to put these fish in a community aquarium, all of a sudden you wouldn't have a community aquarium anymore, you'd have one predator. Predator tanks require special planning. It's not that they're necessarily more difficult, you just need to have a better understanding of the livestock you can put in. If you were to fill your tank with a certain predator and other fish and inverts, you may come to find out that that predator ate all of those fish and killed all of those inverts. So having a good understanding of the diet of that predator and providing them with adequate food source and then choosing fish that they're going to ignore is really important to have a successful predator tank. I wouldn't necessarily recommend a predator tank for a beginner, but if you have your heart set on one specific kind of fish, if the only reason you want to do this hobby is to get that lionfish, then go for it. Do your research, go to the forums, watch videos, plan it really, really well around that one fish, and you'll find success. And tank type number 10 is a nano tank. This is the only tank we're gonna talk about today that's not defined by what you put in it, but it's defined by the size. If you go online, you'll find people talk about nano tanks being under 40 gallons or being under 20 gallons. But typically in the hobby, when we're talking nano tanks, we're talking under 10 gallons, sometimes even as small as five gallons, or I've seen tanks less than a gallon. I do not recommend nano tanks for beginners. I really don't recommend anything 10 gallons or under for beginners. And that's mainly because beginners make mistakes and small mistakes in small tanks change your water parameters very, very rapidly, where if you were to make a small mistake in a bigger tank, it would be diluted out and the effects wouldn't be as bad. A nano tank could be an SPS tank, it can be an LPS tank, it can be a softy tank, it can be a macro algae tank. There's a lot of cool things you can put in a nano tank. While it can be tempting for beginners to start with a nano tank because it saves you a lot of money, I really wouldn't recommend it. I'd recommend starting out with a tank from 15 to 60 gallons. That's a really good beginner tank and a 40 gallon tank is kind of the sweet spot I'd say. Okay, so we've done all 10 types of aquariums. So what types of aquariums would we recommend for beginners? Let's talk about three. The first is a fowler tank. If you just love fish, then build yourself a Fowler tank. Maybe go with something on the larger side. It's gonna be a bit more expensive, but 60 to 120 gallons will allow you to put a lot more and various types of fish. And with the addition of live rock, not only do you greatly enhance your biological filtration, you can also aquascape it in such a way, creating arches and caves and swim throughs and places for your fish to play and hide and feel safe. Plus, live rock will really help you learn a lot about the biological side, especially the nitrogen cycle. And not only that, having that live rock there, if you ever decided in the future to add corals, you would have a place to affix it to. The second aquarium type will recommend is a softy LPS tank. This is my favorite style of tank. I'm just a sucker for the cool corals and for all of the water movement these corals create. Softies and large polyp stony corals come in a wide variety of colors. The water movement's amazing. They don't have really specific feeding requirements. They don't require a lot of light. And oftentimes they're just more forgiving for the mistakes the beginner's gonna make. Some of my absolute favorite corals fit into this category. Things such as frog spawn, hammer, acans, Zoas, Mushrooms, Duncan, Elegance, and there's so many more cool corals that you could put in a softy slash LPS dominant tank. 
And lastly, the third aquarium type we're gonna recommend is a macroalgae tank. This recommendation actually comes from my blogger, Max. I've never built a macroalgae specific tank, but he says they're really good tanks, especially for beginners coming from the salt water side. Macroalgae tank, one, they don't need any sort of fancy filtration and don't even need anything like a sump or protein skimmer because the macroalgae themselves will consume a lot of the nutrients in the water. Not only that, but they come in really cool colors and they're very, very inexpensive when compared with corals. So you could stock an entire tank and make it look gorgeous for $100. At the end of the day, the style of aquarium you choose to build is completely up to you. Our hope with showing you these 10 aquarium types, one, is to give you some good recommendations so you can find success, but also to inspire you, to show you what's possible in this hobby. If you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing to Marine Depot and My First Fish Tank, and don't forget to tune in next week. We're gonna talk about everything you ever wanted to know, well, maybe not everything, but a lot of information about tanks and stands. And maybe, just maybe, at the end of next week, you'll be able to start formulating your own build list and dreaming about the tank you're gonna build. Thanks for watching, everybody, and as always, happy reefing, be well. We'll see you next time.